to John chapter 20. And we'll be kind of around John 20 in the, in the chapters around there. So if you don't have the email, that's totally fine. You know, life is a funny thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about with Ian, actually, he did a, 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 a um, sorry, what is it called? A welcome last week. Talking about sometimes as in life, you are described by your consistency of your behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, who you are in your long term. You're not just one little thing. You know, one donut does not make you fat kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But there are other times where you can do the smallest insignificant thing, and that is now how you are seen. It's true. Have you guys ever seen the movie uh, Big Hero 6? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and the guy's nickname is Wasabi. And they're like, why is his name Wasabi? He's like, I spilled Wasabi on myself one time. And now that was his whole nickname. Wow. You know, sometimes we do eat that donut and someone keeps calling us a glutton. Oh. You know, we do have that one chili cook-off and now we are a chef. Wow. You know, sometimes that, that is how people view you. And you know, yeah. you just have to go with it. Miracle. Um, <laughs> and, 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 even more so, it's relentless when it comes to the sporting world. Your Hall of Famers are sometimes remembered by their most recent falls rather than their heights. That even you have somebody, if you know UFC, Conor McGregor, somebody that was awesome and amazing, his most recent fights he's lost, now people don't even think about him anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, even in the church, I know Sephora, Come she's on. dropped a single. You know, she, she has a platinum album. I know she's not out here, but, you know, why you do like this? Why do like that? Hey, you know, everybody, she said that one time, and now she has a song for it. But actually, throughout the Bible, it, it happens to this as well. You think about Simon, whose Hebrew name meant to listen. He had one response to Jesus, and his whole name was changed forever because of the one right answer he gave to Jesus. Now his name is not Simon, it's Peter named The Rock. He... If you looked at throughout the ministry, he always gave wrong answers. The one time he gets a good one, now his whole name has changed for the rest of scripture. Mm. It's even the same here in John chapter 20, verse 24 through 29. It says, Now Thomas, also known as Dynamis, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, When we have seen the Lord, uh, excuse me, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hands and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Yeah. It's kind of funny. In the same way, because of this scripture, Thomas gained for himself a new title. Doubting Thomas. Mm -hmm. You want to think about how long this would have stuck. <laughs> Even today, we use the phrase doubting Thomas to kind of explain or, um, or, or talk about somebody that describes a critic who refuses to believe without personal experience. So 2,000 years later, we're still talking about Dallas Thomas. Mm -hmm. You would think even personally in his life, after he started to become a missionary in, in India, mm -hmm. they're like, hey, th there, there's Thomas. Wait, what Thomas? It, Doubting Thomas. Wow. He would have overheard it. Like, guys, that was years ago. Can, can you just drop it? I only did that one time. Oh, no, God. he still had that name all over <coughs> throughout his life. You know, you think about it, that this just goes to show that the name that we make from ourselves can sometimes come from just a moment, a moment of weakness. Mm. And it helps us think, you know, what are sometimes the biggest temptations for our spiritual life? Most people might say, well, hey, temptation of impurity of insecurity, of greed, of some addictions in our life, of selfishness. Yeah, I would argue that the biggest temptation of one's spiritual life is the temptation of doubt. Mm -hmm. It is doubt that made Eve eat the forbidden fruit. Mm -hmm. It is doubt that made Abraham laugh at God's plans. It is also doubt that weakens John the Baptist's conviction about Jesus. Even though he was the one that was preparing the way, he started to doubt the way. You know, and the truth be told, I think one of the hardest battles of our spiritual life is the battle of doubt. Mm -hmm. The doubt of if God's going to take care of you in difficult situations. 
the doubt of, is your life actually going to be happier and better the way that God has planned it? The doubt if you can ever change, or even the doubt if God exists. See, for Thomas here, even after three years being in the ministry with Jesus, he still didn't believe in the resurrection. And it wasn't enough just to hear his words that he talked about it. He needed to see it. That's sometimes how we can feel. We read what God said, but we still need to see. We doubt until we see. He required physical evidence even after three years of being trained. He was still thinking in a worldly way. He still didn't understand and master the concept of faith. So today we're going to be talking about this. Talking about how do we master our faith and how do we overcome our doubt. So my title of my lesson tonight is Overcoming Your Doubts. Point number one is stop doubting. Hmm? Yeah, I really love what Jesus says here in Matthew, uh, excuse me, John 20, verse 29. How he responds to Thomas's doubting. He says, then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You know, he starts talking about here that, you know, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. When we look into the dedication of the apostles and the disciples in the Bible, a common explanation for people in their heart can be like, well, you don't understand. They're committed because they saw Jesus. They're committed because they were able to be around the miracles. Um, they had reason to believe so strongly because they saw Jesus resurrect from the dead. Some even wish that they could have been there, right? They could have wished, I, man, I wish I could have had that faith that... Because they, they saw the miracles. I wish I could have been there and seen the scars of Jesus and, and feel his side. And the thing is that, that they think that that's going to actually help them have more faith. Your know, faith wouldn't be so hard if I was there as well. But the Bible actually argues the opposite. It says, actually, it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. Blessed and lucky are those that did not see the miracle and yet still believe. See, seeing Jesus by sight only buries your doubts. It doesn't actually address them. It means it gets you in a point where, hey, I know I should follow Jesus because I saw the miracles, but I still doubt in my heart. Right? Even when they came up to the mountain where Jesus was going to give them their last, com uh, the last command uh, in Matthew 28, it still says some doubt it. Yeah. They're doing it because they needed to. It was an obligation at that point. But they didn't really still get into their doubt. See, more, we are more blessed when we believe when we cannot see because we start to deal with doubt in our hearts. Not because we have to, but because we want to. Because there's a choice involved with this kind of faith. You know, I choose to believe and to trust even though I don't feel like it right now. You know, there are many times even outside of Christianity where this type of faith comes into people's lives. It's kind of like right after a loved one hurts you, and they say, hey, I still love you. That's the time where you have to make that decision to believe them. Mm. Right? I don't feel like they love me right now, and I actually feel quite hurt in this relationship, but I'm going to make that decision to feel loved anyways. Mm. And that's kind of the, the, the decision that we face every time when we say, I, I don't see God working in this area, but I'm still going to decide to believe. Yeah. <coughs> Yo, know, this is kind of the difference between believing in a seatbelt and believing in a parachute. Mm -hmm. Both are going to save your life, but one's a little bit more intimate. You know, wearing the parachute, you're like, okay, yeah, I can see. I've never been in a car crash, but wearing that parachute, you better put it on. You better believe that thing's going to gonna, gonna um, save your life at the end. Mm -hmm. See, the hardest battle was given the simplest of solutions by David, uh, excuse me, by Jesus here. What was his answer? It was these four simple words that we all need in our spiritual walk. He told Thomas, he says, stop doubting and believe. Mm. Four magic words that he gave him. Thomas, you need to stop doubting and you need to decide to believe. <coughs> this is like the response. Um, excuse me, you know, this is kind of like the response when you know somebody is saying something that they shouldn't be saying. And there's kind of like a group around like, what is this guy saying, right? And then one brave soul comes up and says, hey, bro, just shut up. Like, you know, stop saying what you are saying. Stop talking about what you're talking about. It's kind of like the same thing is that we all have in our life that we need to make that decision to believe and stop doubting. 
Because what doubt is, is kind of like us talking to ourselves and giving us reasons not to believe. And Jesus is just saying, hey, I'm going into your mind and in your heart and just telling you, shut up, stop doubting, and you need to believe. And we all need to do that in some parts in our, uh, some areas in our life. I know I needed to do that. When I was becoming a disciple in the church and really kind of getting discipled by different men, um, growing up, I never really had like a good role model of an older person I can look up to. Um, I never had an older male that I was like, okay, I, I want to follow this person or a trusted individual. And so when I came into the church, I always kind of carried that baggage around in my discipling relationships. And what really changed, I, 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 I magically, could, I can't tell people. Some people like, hey, what changed? What, what made your relationship different? I, I actually couldn't tell you. I couldn't give you a point by point what happened. I just stopped. I said, I just got to stop thinking this way. This doesn't help. And once I actually gave that up and was freed from my heart, it was easy to give my heart to Joe, to different people that were kind of getting into my life. Mm -hmm. All I needed to do was just stop thinking that way. <clears throat> you know, it's the same with all of us, that we all just need to get to a point in our life of when is enough going to be enough? Mm -hmm. When are you going to stop entertaining doubts in your life? Have you mastered your doubts or your ma doubts mastering you? Your inner doubts... It gets us thinking different things that what the Bible actually has told us. See, it's the same way why Thomas was being told by Jesus and by everyone else, hey, Jesus has resurrected. He's here. He's heard the word. He's heard the truth. But he said, nah, I still don't believe it yet. And that's the same thing. We ask ourselves, can we? Can I actually do it? Yet we read in the Bible, you can do all things through him who gives you strength. Stop doubting. Believe in the word. You know, we start having doubting about, you know, making disciples. Can't I really baptize one other person? Yet we read in the Bible, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Yeah. Stop doubting, believe in what the Bible has said. You know, we doubt that, hey, can I really have a, a great relationship with God? We read in the Bible how Jesus has been the sacrifice for our sins. We don't need to live our life with guilt or anything on our hearts. Stop doubting and live in a free life. We doubt, man, can't I really change this in my life? There's some things that I just feel I cannot repent of. I feel like it has a hold on me. Yet the Bible talks about after you getting baptized, you live a new life where you don't have to live in the, the slavery of sin anymore. Stop doubting and believe. There is no magic to this, guys. Mm -hmm. That we need to simply hold on to these four magic words that Jesus brought to Thomas. Stop doubting and believe. My first challenge is simply that, guys, is decide to face your fears with your faith. Go after it. Just stop getting those doubts in your hearts that we started to come up with different goals and different um, you know, dreams for our Bible talks and individually. Yeah. And the things that can hold us back is little things, but I don't know if it's really going to work. Yeah. My ministry is different. This is different. It's difficult. Stop doubting and just simply believe that God has called you to do something great in your ministry. Come yeah. on, bro. Just start believing in that. Make a decision. Don't wait for a baptism to happen. Like, oh, wow, we can't baptize yeah. them. No, no. Believe before yeah. that happens. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're going to start to see these miracles that God wants us to, to bring in our life. Point number two is start wanting. You know, I want us to backtrack a little bit and kind of get like a bird's eye view of Thomas's life. Yes, this one moment described him as doubting Thomas for the rest of his life, but who was he before this? Did he have a different name? Did he have a different character in his heart? So here, before do uh, doubting Thomas, we're going to jump over to John chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, turn over to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, we're going to start just in verse 1 through 16 and kind of get a little snippet of Thomas's life before he's known as Doubting Thomas. It says, Now there is a man named Lazarus, uh, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose Jesus' brother uh, Lazarus now lay sick, was the same who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. No, it, will, it is for God's uh, glory, so that his son, uh, God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, 
A short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daylight will not stumble, for they will, for they will see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on, uh, went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, will he get better? They have no idea what he's talking about. Uh, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I will not, uh, I will not be there. Uh, I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. See, picking up this story here, you know, we get confronted, at least in the beginning, that Jesus, prior to this story, that he was getting chased out by the Jews there that wanted to stone him, actually wanted to kill Jesus. And we see that this interaction here that Thomas and the disciples are kind of worried about Jesus. It's like, Jesus, hey, if we go back to Judea, whether it's Lazarus, whoever is sick, you might die. And Jesus kind of talks and says, hey, no, we have to go. Lazarus is dead. He's not just sleeping as you guys keep giving me bad answers all the time. He's dead. I need to go heal him. And who but Thomas, the doubter, is the one that stands up and first, the only first apostle to actually be willing to die for Jesus. Wow. He's the first one to declare this. Before Peter, before anybody else, he's the first one to actually say, hey, we should be willing to die with Jesus as we go back to Judea. But, you know, we see here, well, once he was brave, he almost could have been known for the rest of his life, Brave Thomas. Right? He was the first one to declare this, but the last one to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And it makes us question, well, what changed? What changed from the, the brave Thomas to now the doubting Thomas? Well, we're going to see when his pledge of his, this, this, this conviction, what happened when it was tested? In Mark 14, verse 48 through 50, you don't have to turn there, but it says, Jesus kind of responding when people are coming to arrest him. Am I leading a rebellion, he said? That you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? That's Mark 14, 48 through 50. Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Verse 50, then everyone deserted him and fled. Looking at this and the way that Thomas responded as well as all the other disciples. When their conviction was put to the test, it starts to give me another reason why, and starts to think why Thomas did not really accept that Jesus rose from the dead. I don't think it was a lack of evidence. I think it was due to a lack of heart. Mm. That maybe he wasn't really ready to face Jesus. He wasn't ready to get that confrontational. That he's the one, the first one to say, hey, we're going to be willing to die for you, Jesus. And he ran away just like everybody else. And that would have been hard to face him again. Like, I can't believe that. I can't believe Jesus really died. Not even more so. I can't believe I didn't step up. I can't believe any of these things. I think he lost his conviction that he was unwilling to face Jesus again. That would have been hard. You know, this is one thing that I believe stopped him from having faith. That our, our heart stops us sometimes from having faith. Because we generally don't want it to be true sometimes. When it comes to seeking and saving the lost, and that that's our responsibility, it's not a faith of can we do it. It's just the last time we did it and we gave our hearts to somebody, they tore up our heart and threw it on the ground and stomped on it. Mm -hmm. We don't want to believe that we have to do that anymore. <clears throat> when it comes to doing even greater things for God, we start doubting, I don't know if I can anymore. Why? Because last time I tried my best and it wasn't enough. Mm. I don't really want to do greater things for God. See, when it comes to anything, it starts with really the question, not do you believe, but do you want it to be true? Mm -hmm. Is that something that you want in your life? See, faith is held by our <coughs> desires. Because it's easy to have faith with things that we want, right? For wanting our, our, our family to believing, man, this is going to be awesome. They're going to start studying the Bible. This is great. When you really want that in our heart, you have all the faith in the world. Yeah. 
You know, when, when, when you start, when you really want to go to a conference, when you really want to do something, you'll do anything. You have, you have um, faith that God's going to answer your prayers. Why? Because you really want it. But when it comes to things that you don't really want, you don't really have faith in it. Yeah. And it always goes back to, what do you really want? Mm. See, most people believe in God without even hearing. Oh, excuse me, without even having to rest their eyes on Him. Most people in the world but suppress that knowledge, right? We go, with, we go up to everybody, mostly when we share our faith. Hey, do you believe in God? Well, I believe there's something. There has to be something, right? They, they believe in something. But what's the real problem? It's not that they don't see God. It's that they don't want God to exist, mm -hmm. right? Because if God exists, then that means there's judgment. Yeah. And that's not what they want. So, so it's easier just to say, I don't have faith. It's so much easier. In the same way, guys, we have to really go and challenge our hearts. What do you really want? Because if you don't want to do great things for God, you won't have faith that you ever will. If you don't really want to spend that time to baptize people, you have faith that, you know, you have little faith that the harvest is really plentiful. If you don't want to do anything, your faith is going to resemble that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something where we have to just get into our hearts and change the desires of our hearts. Is go back just like how Jesus did before the cross. Is hey, this is not what I want. But God, can you please change my desire? Change my wants. Mm -hmm. You know, see Thomas here looking at it in conclusion. I believe, yes, he had doubting and he had to face his doubts in his faith. But I think mainly he just had a heart issue. And Jesus simply went to him and said, Jesus, uh, excuse me, Thomas, I just need to encourage you, man. Stop doubting and believe. Mm -hmm. Become the disciple who you were before. And I, believe, I believe Thomas at that point, he was hoping that he would be now known as the, the you know, brave Thomas again. But sorry, that didn't really work out for him. But, you know, he started to just encourage him again. Thomas, stop doubting and believe. Become that guy who you were before. And right after Thomas gets challenged by those four words, that's when Thomas starts to say, my Lord and my God again. Mm. Right after this, I don't believe those Thomas still doubting. They bring him back up to Matthew 28, right? It says, go and make disciples of all nations. Thomas travels all the world and even to India. And there he dies for Jesus. Wow. Yeah. yeah, he might have been known for that one little name and everything. Mm -hmm. But yet we still see him live out the name that he really had. Mm -hmm. Is the brave Thomas. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to encourage you guys. You know, what do you want to identify you? Is it your doubts and your fear or the faith in your decisions to believe in God? just want to encourage everybody. We have our goals. We have our dreams. Whatever little doubts you have in your heart, don't believe it. Just stop doubting and believe. And that's the lesson for tonight. Come on. Awesome, guys.